We've had a big debate on the public sector. And we've had a lot of economists tell us that the public sector is inefficient. It is uh, destroying the economy. It is crowding out public investment. Uh, and that the privatization of the public sector would be to Pakistan's advantage. And this has been such a one-sided sort of uh, narrative that I think without really examining the data in detail, people have tended to accept this narrative. And a lot of times they've accepted it on the basis of what we would consider to be uh, spurious or um, you know, uh, anecdotal evidence rather than really looking at what's going on. I think it's no secret, uh, and I don't need to repeat that uh, in the, from the 1970s, you see that um, uh, the public sector enormously expands and continues in that particular way throughout the 1980s as well. It's really in the 1990s that you see structural adjustment policies come into full swing, and you see the destruction of the public sector. So really, we're looking at a public sector that's quite dominant from, or not dominant, but quite prominent, rather, from the 1970s onwards. Whereas in the previous case, you had a situation where the, uh, the PIDC would set up these, these uh, would help to set up the private sector. In both instances, government interference or intervention is actually quite important. Even to set up the private sector, government intervention is quite important. If you leave the private sector to its own devices, you don't really see very good results in the context of Pakistan, and by the way, in the context of most third world countries. So people like Ethe Shamul Haq and many others have written extensively on this, and you can see it on TV and in media all the time. What is the case for privatization? It is this, that the government of Pakistan is strapped with a huge public debt. We cannot meet our expenditures. We have a big debt to pay. On the one hand, an international debt, on the other hand, a domestic debt. Tax revenues never keep pace with the expenditures of the government. So how do we manage this entire problem? Well, economists have argued that to reduce the public debt, what we've got to do is we've got to privatize these big state-owned enterprises, these loss-making, corrupt, inefficient state-owned enterprises. Then we will be lean and mean and we'll do much better. So for example, Huck argues that rupees 400 billion are the losses as a result of the public sector. And this is an amount greater than what the government spends on the development budget in an entire year. So it's a huge, huge loss he's talking about. The loss of SOEs is equal to 1.5 to 2% of the GDP of the country. Right? That's a very, very significant amount of money. What is the reason for this loss? He argues that the, uh, the boards are made up of uh, really poor personnel. They are unable to handle these situations. These are often appointments made on a political basis rather than on the basis of whether these people are efficient and good managers of public enterprises. These are not merit-based appointments. And there is little ownership of those enterprises and little accountability of those enterprises. Who are we talking about? Who, what are these enterprises? We are talking about a few, really the most important of them are Vapda. We're talking about Pepco, which is of course also sort of part of the Ministry of en uh, Energy and Power, etc. We're talking about PASCO, we're talking about PIA, we're pa pa talking about Pakistan steel mills, we're talking about railways, and we're talking about utility stores corporations. These are the big enterprises that are also making a loss and that we need to do something about, all right? So PIA losses itself go up to 70 million a day, from 50 to 70 million rupees a day. Big loss. Pakistan railway losses 35 to 50 million rupees a day. Half the trains of, pa of Pakistan railways are no longer uh, capable of being operated. They're just too old. Employment is over 1 lakh people. It can be as low as 40,000, Huck alleges. Is this true? We don't know, but that's his estimate. That's his point of view. So when we look at this data, it seems quite logical. Disinvest from Vapda, Pepco, Pasco, PIA, Pakistan Steel Mills, Railways, Utility Stores, you will save a lot of money instead of pushing all this money into these companies that are unable to make profits. So under this idea then, privatization of Pakistan's major industries was planned. You can see 129 major units were going to be privatized. 
Uh, by the time of 1993, this is the amount that was received. These were the uh, number of companies that were privatized, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, this is quite outdated. You can go to the website of the Privatization Commission of Pakistan and get the updated statistics. I ought to have done that. My apologies for not doing so, but I'm trying to stick to the, to the data presented in the chapter. That's why I stuck with this particular number. Now, when the privatizations began in the 1990s, one of the big things that happened were the big scandals that came out in the newspapers that really completely undermined uh, not only the process of privatization, but also created the impression amongst the readers and uh, uh, people who were reading the news and people who were watching the news, etc., that Pakistan's government has become really, really incredibly corrupt. So the big corruption scandals are not the Pakistani policeman taking 100, 200 rupees to forgive you a chalan for you. It's this stuff here, which is, you know, really created the impression in Pakistan that Pakistan is incredibly corrupt. Now, first and foremost, let me explain to you what the privatization paradox is. The privatization paradox is that the big loss-making enterprises, enterprises like Pakistan Railways and Vapta and so on and so forth, nobody wants to buy. If you are a private capitalist, would you go ahead and buy a company that was huge and massive and made a huge and massive loss? Uh, or would you want to prefer to buy a company that was relatively small and made a profit? The answer is self-evident. The amount of capital you would have stuck in a big enterprise which makes a lot of uh, loss, in order to, for you to turn that into a profit, you, you might have to upgrade its equipment, you might have to invest in better newer personnel, new and better equipment, so you might have to make a very serious large capital outlay and you might recover your losses only after a pretty long period of time. So, so people, uh, investors generally, don't want to buy the loss-making SOEs. Instead, what they want to buy uh, in a list of things that if a government, whenever a government gives you a list of things that, that they're ready to privatize, Investors first look down the list and see what are the ones from which I can make money, because that's what investors want to do. What are the ones that are already making money? Let me buy those ones, right? So the ones that the government really ought to sell, it can't sell. And the ones that the government ought not to sell, it ends up selling. This is the privatization paradox. So first of all, the corruption. Pakistan Steel Mills was a huge scandal in Pakistan. Why? Because it was sold for 21 billion rupees. In fact, the Employees and Management Consortium, that's the trade union, plus the, uh, uh, plus the um, uh, management, etc., board, etc., offered more. They offered 24 billion rupees, yet it wasn't sold to them. And when it was sold, it was sold in a quick, you know, 30 minutes. And other independent people calculated that, in fact, just the real estate of Pakistan Steel Mill was worth 27 billion rupees. Forget the plant itself. Just the land was worth much more than the... Uh, than uh, what the deal was made for. And then the cabinet and the PM didn't approve it. It was approved just by the commission itself. So that caused a real big problem. Finally, uh, Iftikhar Chaudhary took a SOMOTO notice of that particular uh, privatization. And this caused one of the big breaks between Musharraf and the Chief Justice at the time, then resulting in the lawyers' movement. One of the central issues was the privatization of Pakistan Steel Mill and the higher judiciary taking note of the corruption. Shokat Aziz was very deeply implicated on this, and there was a big charge that he basically facilitated this deal by taking a huge kickback. Then secondly was Pakistan Engineering. Now, when, the land for, when Pakistan Engineering was sold, it was, it was stated in the contract that the, that, the, that the real estate could only be used for industrial purposes. It would not be sold off or used for commercial purposes. And yet, after it was privatized, that thing was deleted. Once that thing was deleted, the private owner basically used the real estate and sold it, Badami Bagh real estate, etc. He sold it, etc. And uh, to, to, for people to set up their you know, shops, etc. And made a killing off of it. But the engineering works themselves didn't take off. Now the government could have done the same thing. right? Government could have sold some of it, the excess land that Pakistan Engineering had and could have paid back its entire debt and yet had the plant running. So these sort of scandals really, and there are many, many more we can talk about. I'm just giving you two. There are really too many to mention even. They have been in Pakistani newspapers since the 90s. You know, every time there's a privatization, there's a huge scandal 
that comes out with it. And so this has really undermined the degree of accountability for privatization. It's a very corrupt process, basically. Um, secondly, and more importantly, what does the da data actually show with respect to the productivity of private and public enterprises? This is the key thing that economists have been skirting around and never actually addressing. And we have the data, okay? If we look at it in an index from 1972 all the way up to 1981, we can look at it beyond, et cetera. We see that on every single index, the public sector is actually outperforming, the, this is the private sector, this is the public sector. The public sector is outperforming the private sector in terms of productivity. And now this may come as a surprise to you that how can they be loss making and yet be more productive? The answer is that they have enormous economies of scale. To be more productive, the number one thing you require is economies of scale. These are incredibly large enterprises with massive economies of scale. You know when the Chinese want to build something, they want to make a pencil, they don't make 100,000 pencils, they make 10 billion pencils. They make a plant that can produce a billion pencils a year or something like that, right? And then they have big savings, big economies of scale. That's what these enterprises can do. So labor productivity is actually higher in these enterprises than it is in, um, in the private enterprises. So uh, again, t he says, the table clearly shows, on a weighted average of productivity growth in the public sector was higher than in the private sector. Very clear. Um, another study by Nakvi and Kamal shows that of the eight corporations which run the public enterprises, five of them accounting for 71% of output originated in public enterprises have been reasonably profitable, even from a strictly commercial view. To continue, it is presumed that the effective rates of protection are usually higher for the public sector than the private enterprises, but their results show that these rates are relatively lower in industries where public enterprises dominate. So public enterprises are actually Private enterprises are more protected than public enterprises, which are more open to market competition. Similarly, the industries dominated by the public sector do not suffer from a higher level of inefficiency than that observed in the private sector. Hence, efficiency levels across industries are independent of the locus of ownership. It's not true that they're more, less efficient than the other side. The incidence of the worst kinds of allocative efficiency inefficiency sorry, is in the private sector rather than in the public sector. Allocative inefficiency is when you allocate resources to things that don't need to be produced. And this is something we don't even look at when we talk about privatization. Let me finish, then I'll come to you. Of the 60 inefficient industries identified, only nine were in the public sector. And finally, capacity utilization is always higher in public enterprises, where 39 of the 60 enterprises had capacity utilization rates exceeding 75%. They are operating almost to full capacity. If they can produce, you know, uh, 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 you know, 10,000 uh, tickets a month or something, they are producing up to 80, you know, 8,000, 9,000 tickets, right? Whereas private enterprises have a greater capacity, but actually deliberately underproduce. Why do they, do they deliberately underproduce? If you've done your economics, you know that they will produce at the point where MC is equal to MR, not at the point where output is maximized. Profit maximization is not the same point of output as output maximization. Any economist worth his salt will know that. So what public enterprises do is they, they try to maximize output. They are not trying to maximize profit. In fact, they will deliberately run at a loss in order to cross-subsidize the private sector. So for example, if VAPTA is running at a loss, do you think VAPTA, as Saad pointed out, can't make a profit? Just raise your prices, everybody will have to pay the money. Right? Then why does WAPDA run at a loss? Because when you lower your prices, you get higher output coming from the private sector. If electricity is cheaper, profits are higher, output is higher. So you run, deliberately run, transport, communications, power, etc., at a loss even, out of taxpayers' money, in order to push the private sector and push the overall macroeconomy to grow faster. This was the logic of why essential services are in the public domain rather than, the, than in the private domain. So, um, okay, so 
uh, Kamal and Heather also t tell us that changing the locus of ownership, the form of ownership of industries is by itself neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for an efficient operation of specific industrial enterprises. So when you change management from pr public to private, it has not shown the results that you expected, which is that uh, efficiency would, be, would improve. It didn't, didn't show that. This was the mantra, right? The incentive structure is such that people will respond automatically. And they conclude there's nothing good or bad about the public or private sector. It's about how you run it and so on.